So first, uh, congratulations on your director film directorial debut. I know you've Thank done you. TV series yeah. for, for the House of, House of Lies and everything, but tell me about. I mean, I've read about, it, but tell me why that was important in portraying Miles Davis' character for you to do uh, everything, direct and do everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, I kind of, to be honest, I, I I tried to give that role away uh, a few years ago because I trying to look down the line thought this is going to be impossible you know yeah. it's too many things to do yeah uh, and I interviewed several directors for the role uh, for the job rather uh, and all all of them to a person said but this is yours you yeah. know yeah you you need to do this I'm like yeah but I'm trying to survive it <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. well do your push-ups but you know this <laughs> is this is yours to bring to life and yeah. ultimately uh, I'm, I'm I'm glad that I uh, came back to seeing it that way too I know it's been, it was a process with the finance and, and uh, the going through the directors and, but did that? Do you think that helped the, the story form into the way it was like after that process and the budgets and everything? Do, do you think that absolutely, made the story? absolutely. You know the 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 having to keep coming back to reducing the budget from you know something south of twenty to fifteen to seven, you know fourteen to thirteen to twelve ten. And this these were steps that we took all along the way trying to finally get someone to say yes and get yeah. a green light and get that money started. But it, 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 it forced us to get very um, specific and really tight and lean and contract that thing to where it was its most potent. Right. And I think that happened over the course of time that you know, we didn't cut off limbs, but we were cutting you know, fingertips yeah. really, really tight and getting it down to where it was just lean and mean, and we were able finally to get the money to do it. With all of the recent biopics that's come out, you know, um, like, why was it important for this to be stylized different? You, know, you think the audience was uh, experiencing biopic fatigue or something? Like I knew that? I was. Yeah. You know, it's nothing that I was looking for to do, uh, and had it not been announced that I was going to do it by his nephew. Would it have been Chad Bozeman? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know who it would have been, You've but been so it weird. may have been in a different form. Yeah, um, yeah. And I thought, you know, maybe you can do that with some people, but for me, it, it felt like an affront to do that with Miles Davis, because yeah. nothing about Miles Davis, is, when I think about him, is conventional or straight ahead or easily fit into a box. Right. You know, I said, I think this movie has to feel like a Miles Davis experience. It has to be uh, inventive and innovative and crazy and gangster and like a heist movie and yeah. feel like jazz and feel like that ex that expression. Yeah. So uh, it, it just felt anathema to do it in uh, that other way that we know all too well. Right. Uh, That's in the forte scene. Yeah. Like we're coming That's in. That's right. So. That's right. And I wanted to sting it, you know, hit it. Yeah. And really take it off. Then they got to... Mm, mm, mm. Oh, yeah, man. Y'all listening to them? Yeah. That's how this shit's supposed to sound. And hold that over the next next measure. Hold that over the mm -hmm. measure. Yeah, and then let it resolve. Let it groove. Yeah, let it groove. We should get them back in. <sighs> Let's do it. Let's get them back Thanks, in. man. Deal. Record this. All right, guys, you're on rehearsal. Take three. Y'all, let's be musical about this shit. Be wrong, strong, okay? Otherwise, let it fuck out. Let's go, kill. Count it off. One, two, one, two. Some musicians like the Jimi Hendrix uh, recent movie had problems getting rights to the music and everything. And since you had the the Davis estate behind you, did mm -hmm. you have the whole catalog of Miles Davis to work with as far as music? And we had all that they owned, yeah, <laughs> which is um, not the entire catalog. There's some that predates the period that they have, and there's some that comes after the period that they have that are owned by different entities, mm -hmm. different parts of Miles' family, in fact. Yeah. Uh, but we had a pretty good ability to get licensing from those other places working with the family that they could, you know, reach out and, and, and talk to those uh, other uh, players and, and get us all kinds of music that we wouldn't have been able to get on our own. Was it important that you pick, like, different 
music from different albums to tell the story? Like, and how did you kind of was was in directing? Was that part of your design to say, all right, we're gonna do this to to work with the score? I guess for the for the music. Yeah, well, I, I know when I listen to Miles Davis music, it's cinematic. It feels like there's it's already made to put into a movie and to be score and to be a uh, source and to be little these interstitial moments, these cues that we have. His music's just lined up like that. So it wasn't difficult to find something from Bitches Blue or the Jack Johnson or the Bootlegs or So What or kind of you know Sketches of Spain and it just felt like it worked perfectly with the scene. Now we didn't always have because you know, a lot of times Miles, you'd say something and have Miles' name on it. We go, oh, we can use it. It's Miles Davis' song. Like, well, Miles Na- Davis' name is on it, but that's not actually his song, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah. often we had to deal with different entities and different publishing, uh, you know, constraints. But at the end of the day, we were able to use, as you said, a vast array of his music, and I think it all really tells the the, the story in a way that makes it feel like it's a movie, yeah. as opposed to a Let's make sure we get something off of this and make sure we get something off of that so people know that we know he did that. I'm like, who cares? What does that matter? And writing the script, I mean, did you start with this theme of, uh, we're going to start with this this interview? Did, was the mm-hmm. interview always a part of your yeah, con- conception it of it? Yeah. yeah, it was always how we wanted to construct that and have it kind of bookend it with this, this person trying to put Miles on the record and say how he's going to lay his life out. And Miles saying, no, I'm going to lay my life out. Right. I'm going to tell you how I'm going to do that and put his horn to his lips and play it. Yeah, That was always the conceit. I, I know that music today gets a hard time. I guess music in every generation kind of got a hard time by previous generations, but when you look at the artistry and the genius of Miles Davis where it was like, oh, do this F sharp here, or the, the, well, the minus seven thing that I, yeah. I didn't even understand. Yeah. I mean, do you think when you look at our musical artists today that they get that? Do they get that? Like if Lil Wayne, could he be like, no, nah, that's an F sharp? Is, he might know? be able to hear it. He may not be able to articulate exactly what it is, but, you know, and, you know, uh, Errol Garner, one of the greatest pianists that's ever lived, couldn't read music, mm. you know? So it, it's not necessary for you to have that specific training and that language and understand the theory in those ways to have an ability to, pr- to create it. Yeah. It definitely helps, and it helps you to communicate to other people who speak that same language. But, uh, you know, you look at somebody like Kendrick Lamar, and you know that whether he can tell you B flat major, or F sharp minor, or whatever, he understands music, mm-hmm. and he clearly has a connection with how the music that came before is supporting and helping push him forward to where he wants to go. Kamasi Washington, Rob Glasper, who composed our movie, worked on To Pimp a Butterfly. Yeah. These guys are all the the vanguard and all the new cats that are doing it and Herbie you know Hancock you know very publicly said thank you guys for for carrying the torch so we're music's in a good place you right. know music's in a good place and I was very fortunate to work with a lot of those cats that are are tasked themselves with you know holding the vessel and carrying it on and last question and 94 pages such a, a tight script like how how much leeway did you get in production to, to, for anything to go wrong? Uh, there was, <laughs> you know, at the end we have a 100-minute movie, yeah. and the first assembly of our movie was 104 minutes. So that should let you know that we did, there was no fat. We didn't shoot. There's one scene that we shot that's not in the movie, and that scene is 28 seconds long. Mm. So there's 28 seconds that we shot that we did not put in the movie. So yeah. we were very, uh, very... Um, uh, disciplined and and uh, slavish to what we had to be as far as our financial limitations and the schedule limitations and the limitations of Cincinnati in order to do what we needed to do. Great movie, man. Great for music and everything. I Thank you, man. It.